Hi, everyone. It is great to see you all in person. Um, you will uh, get an email from me about the plans for Wednesday and Friday of this week. Um, we will be having virtual class again, uh, and you will get more info from me. Um, also, remember that there is um, an inquisitive assignment um, for Wednesday. Um, and I might move it, I might actually make the due date Friday um, just because of being behind and the fact that I am not going to be grading it, looking at it on Wednesday anyway. Um, and uh, you should also have received an email from me with info about. Um, getting prepped or starting to think about the review session for exam two, um, which is Wednesday of next week. Um, so just be aware of all that um, coming up um, and make sure to think about using lab time um, efficiently um, since we're not going to be having lab this week. Today we're going to continue talking about T cell activation. Um, the part of T cell activation that we're going to be talking about today, um, in my mind, is a very, 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 very important part. Uh, it's one that I think people often um, underestimate. And so hopefully you will um, realize uh, the importance of this aspect of um, T cell activation that we talked about today. Um, so again, orienting you. Um, we're still in this block of time um, between infection and when we have this nice, large, measurable uh, T-cell response. Um, so we're still figuring out what the heck was taking so long um, for the T-cell response to really get turned on well. Um, we can also kind of think about the fact that we are sort of zoomed in on what's going on right now all the way to the left here where our naive CD8 T cell is interacting with an antigen presenting cell or our naive CD4 cell is interacting with an antigen presenting cell um, getting a signal through the T cell receptor like we saw on Friday um, eventually making some IL-2 that it can feed to itself and to its close neighbors to help them um, proliferate um, and eventually differentiate. Um, but there is one other point of this that is particularly important. Um, and so that one other point that is uh, particularly important has to do with a step that is happening here at um, this activation as well. So we talked about what kind of signals the T cell gets through the T cell receptor on Friday. Um, but in reality, we were largely talking about something known as signal one, um, which is this T cell receptor signaling. You can see signal one in this figure from uh, the Kubi textbook, as well as in this figure from your textbook. Um, in properly activating a T cell, we need multiple signals. Um, the most famous of which, and the one that we're really going to be talking about today, um, for the most part, is called signal two. Um, some people talk about sort of an idea of signal three. Um, other people just say, yeah, there's also a lot of cytokines that are doing things. Um, you saw one example of those cytokines, uh, which was IL-2. On Friday, you will see far more examples of those cytokines um, on Wednesday. Um, but today, we're really going to focus on this signal known as signal two, um, also known as a co-stimulatory signal. And you can see that it involves a different set of proteins um, than those that are in the T cell receptor. It's giving a different sort of s signal transduction cascade. Um, eventually, those two signal transduction cascades will interact with one another. But it is uh, a different signal, which is why it's referred to as a co-stimulatory signal. 
Um, I'll talk more specifically about the proteins that are involved in those co-stimulatory signal um, in a few slides. But what you should notice about them right uh, as we're talking is that sometimes students get confused about which proteins are on which cell. Um, so note that the one that is listed here as CD28 is on the T cell. It's along with the T cell receptor CD4 or CD8 and CD3. So CD28 is on the T cell. The one that's listed here as B7 is on the antigen presenting cell. Again, you'll see much that over and over again, but that's one thing that I know in the past students have been confused about. So in order to really kind of talk through signal two and activation of signal two and activation of a T cell, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about this antigen presenting cell um, and some details regarding the antigen presenting cell. The most famous cells that we talk about as antigen presenting cells in um, many of our responses are dendritic cells. Dendritic cells are a type of innate immune cell. I've told you a little bit about them before. Um, they are somewhat closely related to uh, monocytes. If, we were cl if I was classifying amongst my myeloid cells, I would classify dendritic cells along with those monocytes, at least for the purposes of this class. Um, it, once you actually get into the nitty gritty of this, it gets real messy, but I'm not going there right now. However, dendritic cells are particularly important because a, their job is largely to turn on an adaptive immune response. And so while they are in themselves innate cells, they are helping to turn on adaptive immune cells. You didn't see much in the way of dendritic cells when you looked at blood smears in lab one because dendritic cells don't tend to spend their time in the blood. Um, dendritic cells largely are spending time in different tissues, sort of as sentinels, um, checking out what's going on in the tissues. And so here you can see a dendritic cell in the skin of this foot. Um, and that dendritic cell will hang out in that location. When it is in that location, it will mostly be an immature dendritic cell, which really looks a lot like a monocyte. Um, so we can sort of think of it as a, this resting dendritic cell that's shown here, or this immature dendritic cell. If, however, that dendritic cell encounters a microbe, that dendritic cell will become activated. And so you can see that happening in this cartoon where the dendritic cell interacts with the red dot, the microbe, um, and becomes activated. And many changes happen to dendritic cells when they are activated. Some of those changes are easily visible under a microscope. So you can see an immature versus an activated or more mature dendritic cell here. Um, you can see that the dendritic cell has these long, skinny projections on it. Um, that's in some way helping have a, a lot more surface area. Um, this is actually why these cells were named dendritic cells. When early histologists were looking at them under the microscope, they sort of thought they it looked a little like the dendrites that they saw in neurons. Um, I will also point that out. They have nothing to do with the dendrites and neurons. They are in no way related. It's just from that similar shape. Um, I mention this because um, at one point during the pandemic, um, I was giving a talk, uh, a science communication talk about how mRNA vaccines work. Um, and it was to a group of physicians. And I mentioned the dendritic cell what was happening with the dendritic cell at one point during the talk. And someone said to me, oh, so if I'm understanding you correctly, what you're saying is that the vaccine goes into the neurons and gives everyone MS. Because when I said dendritic cell, he thought I meant neuron. So no, they're not the neurons. 
They're not related to the neurons. Totally different. <laughs> um, it's really just that they happen to have little projections off of them when they're activated. Um, these cells um, are really good at phagocytosis. And they're actually relatively good at phagocytosis, um, even pretty early on. They are awesome at phagocytosing whatever is around. So we've got a lot of phagocytosis, but if that dendritic cell phagocytoses something with, you know, PAMPs, MAMPs, it actually gets turned on by some microbial signal, that cell is going to turn on more expression of MHC. So suddenly that cell is going to have more MHC on its surface. That cell is going to have more of a lot of other proteins on its surface that are very important for turning on um, a good T cell response. And that uh, cell is going to spend less of its time doing phagocytosis and instead that cell is going to move. And so that cell is now going to traffic and is going to say, hey, I found something, I need to go to a lymph node. And so our cell is going to do the trafficking pathway that we talked about previously to move to a lymph node to show that thing that it has phagocytosed to T cells. So immature dendritic cells are sort of chilling in tissues, just phagocytosing things. If they happen to phagocytose something, they will move. They will also turn on a large number of cell surface proteins so that they can do all sorts of T cell stimulation. They'll make some cytokines. They'll make lots of MHC. Um, so they are going to be able to really start our T cell response quite well. Um, and that might happen because they did some endocytosis of um, bacteria and are presenting on class two um, or uh, of viruses to present on class two. That might happen because they are infected by viruses and present them on class one or because they can cross present. They have that special cross presentation ability that I told you about before. So they can take things that they have uh, phagocytosed and present them on MHC class one. Because dendritic cells, thanks to all of these cytokines and proteins on their surface, are the all-stars at turning on T cells. If you have a T cell that you want turned on the first time, when that T cell is first seeing its antigen, you really want it to be seeing its antigen from a dendritic cell. You really hope that this is a dendritic cell turning on this T cell for the first time because the dendritic cell is so good at um, T cell stimulation thanks to all of these proteins on the cell surface. Um, and that's why it's important that dendritic cells have so many different types of MHC presentation pathways available to them. The most important of all of these proteins on the surface of the dendritic cell is the protein that is going to allow the dendritic cell to provide signal to. T cell activation requires signal two. So if our T cell does not get both signal one and signal two, we don't turn that T cell on. This question about sort of how this worked and hypotheses about what was going on here basically opened an entire new field of immunology um, that led to some Nobel Prizes and some other things. It also led to a theory that was not well accepted for a while. Um, when I was an undergraduate, it was not particularly well accepted. And so the phrases from that theory are really useful for me in teaching. I'm gonna use them. And the whole time I'm gonna worry that I'm, I'm gonna feel like maybe I might be struck by lightning at any moment because I'm saying these phrases that I feel like I shouldn't, but that's okay. Um, so the thing that is really important here with our 
uh, dendritic cell providing signal to is that our dendritic cell isn't providing signal to all the time. Antigen presenting cells like dendritic cells only make our co-stimulatory molecule to provide signal to some of the time. And the specific reason why our dendritic cell will make co-stimulatory molecules is because they have sensed something with a PRR. So a dendritic cell has to get some signal from a PRR in order to turn on the production of co-stimulatory molecules. So there has to be some microbe present for the dendritic cell to make a co-stimulatory molecule. The hypothesis that sort of came out of this was this hypothesis of the danger signal. So the dendritic cell presents whatever peptides it's got on MHC class 1 and potentially MHC class 2, but especially MHC class 1. But it doesn't also give this second co-stimulatory signal unless it's got PRR stimulation as a way to be like, hey, T cell, this thing I got, it's dangerous. There, there was some foreignness about this. You need to pay attention. You need to really get some kind of signal. Um, when that happens, our dendritic cell will make a co-stimulatory molecule um, that's shown here as B7. There are, in reality, a lot of co-stimulatory molecules. Um, and we're just going to focus on, uh, we will focus on a couple sort of key ones, but we'll talk about B7 here. If we are being totally technical, and I'm telling you this because it may show up in the textbook or you may come across it in reading, there are actually two B7s. They're called B71 and B72. Um, B71 and B72 are also known as CD80 and CD86. And so you may also hear about CD80 or CD86. Those are the same things as B71 and B72. And for our purposes, all of those things mean the same thing. <laughs> Um, but in case you come across it in reading something, that is one detail I've had students get confused about in the past. Um, and so you can see that our B7 co-stimulatory molecule is made by our dendritic cell that binds to this C28 protein on our T cell, and that is required for the T cell to be fully turned on. The dendritic cell only makes B7 because it has seen a PRR uh, ligand. And so it is basically a signal to the dendritic cell that there is a pathogen around. And so the proteins that it is presenting are likely important ones, um, dangerous ones, that the T cell really needs to be aware of. So let's think for a second about a situation where a dendritic cell might be presenting a peptide where there isn't a PRR signal. So let's imagine a situation where the dendritic cell is presenting a peptide on its MHC, but does not make B7 because there was no PRR stimulus around. Um, I often think about this as happening on class one. It could happen on class two or class one, but class one in my head, it's always class one. So in my, I'm pretending in my head it's class one. What might a situation be where we are seeing presentation of a peptide on class one without also seeing B7 production? No PRR was present to make the dendritic cell make B7. What could be going on to make this sort of thing happen? Yeah, Michael. Um, that means that the antigen the ADC was just chopping at proteins in its, in its cytoplasm, found something that resembled it, but it wasn't like an active or anything like that? 
So if it's not microbe, what is it? Uh, self. self. So remember I told you that our cells are constantly presenting whatever proteins they have in their cytoplasm. They're presenting self proteins all the time, right? If there are no microbes around, then we're just presenting self proteins. We don't really want the T cells to be active. And so we don't actually provide this signal to fully activate the T cell. This is actually part of the way we avoid an autoimmune reaction, is we don't turn on the T cell unless there's evidence of a microbe around to turn on that B7 molecule. Um, remember that every T cell that comes out of the thymus is a little bit self-reactive. Every T cell that comes out of the thymus had to be able to get some interaction with self MHC plus peptide in the thymus in order to be positively selected. And so every T cell could be mistakenly turned on. However, if it wasn't turned on in the, when there was a pathogen around, which we know because of the, um, the provision of B7, um, then that must be self-antigen, and we shouldn't turn that T cell on. Um, the idea here is that um, many of our self protein, many of our self peptides that we could present are going to be relatively similar to microbial peptides. And this just shows a bunch of those examples. And so if the T cell is stimulated somewhat weakly by um, one of these self peptides, then maybe the similar protein from a pathogen, like this polio protein that's similar to the acetylcholine uh, peptide, um, will turn on the T cell. And when we have the case of the microbe, we've got the PRR. So we can now provide B7 along with T cell receptor stimulation, and we can fully activate our T cell. Um, so this is sort of the way that we are dealing with the fact that all of those T cells are partially self-reactive, is we kind of almost have the T cells on a little bit of a leash. We don't actually let them get fully activated unless the dendritic cell also has evidence that there's a microbe around based on its PRR stimulation. Um, does this so far make sense? Um, also, just so you know, um, immunologists use this knowledge a lot in experiments in that if we actually want to turn on T cells in a dish, we have to stimulate the, uh, them through both signal one and signal two. And so we generally have to use some stimulus that turns on signal one. Um, we can use either a drug or we can use an antibody that binds to CD3 and stimulates it and something that turns on signal 2, CD28. So we can, again, use an antibody against CD28 to get stimulation. If we only give one or the other of those stimuli, only signal 2, no signal 1, or only signal 1, no signal 2, we don't see our T cells proliferating in a dish. There's another piece to this uh, model of um, signal one and signal two. So I know we already talked about this, but we're going to just put it out on the table again. What is happening in the case where a T cell is seeing signal one but not signal two in your body, not in a dish? If a T cell sees signal one but not signal two, what's actually going on? Yeah, Michael. The cell's presenting itself. So we're seeing presentation of a self antigen to that T cell, right? 
Do we want to turn on that T cell? No. But it actually is more than that. If a T cell sees signal one without seeing signal two, it doesn't just not get activated. That T cell actually gets turned off. And so if a T cell sees signal one without signal two, that T cell gets a signal to uh, go into a state of energy or to become an energic T cell. You've heard about the state of energy previously when we talked about B cells because one of our outcomes for B cells in the bone marrow is that B cells can go to the state of energy. So what was the state of energy? What does that mean? Yes, Ermi. So they're inactivated, they're still present, and if something super crazy happened, they could be turned on. But you'd really think of them as totally off for all intents and purposes, unless some sort of like apocalypse of immune response is happening, <laughs> then they could get turned back on. And so it's the same thing. We're going to have this cell that is presenting antigen on MHC, but is not making signal to, because there is no microbe around to signal through PRRs and induce um, our signal to uh, B7, CD86 formation. So not only do we not activate the T cell, we turn that T cell off. We say, hey, T cell, you are responding to some cell antigen. You are not good. We do not want you. This is also often something that we might see in the case where um, a non-dendritic cell might be presenting an, uh, an antigen. Um, you know, so here you can see a pancreatic beta cell, one of the proteins that it's just going to have chillin in its, uh, as a cell, is insulin. It's at some point going to present insulin, and some T cell might bind. And if that T cell binds, it's going to bind without getting signal two. And we're going to turn that T cell off and say, no, 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 T cell. You, you're responding to a self protein, insulin. You, you could potentially lead me to autoimmunity. We're going to turn you off. We don't want you. Um, you could imagine that if this process goes wrong, either if we turn, if something, if that whole apocalypse business happens and we turn on the energic cell later in life, or if something goes wrong in terms of when we provide signal two or when we don't provide signal two, that could lead to autoimmunity. And in fact, that is thought to be a, those sort of issues are thought to be extremely common um, issues with autoimmunity. I mean, extremely common ways autoimmunity can happen, which we will see so much more of when we talk about autoimmunity specifically. Yeah, Michael. So does this mean that most T cells are in the energy state, or is it really only like a select few that are more self-reactive than the other ones? Um, a lot of T cells are going to be in the energetic state. Um, remember that you're making new T cells throughout life. And so you know, it's sort of a question of what does that T cell first encounter? Um, or where does it first encounter its antigen? Realize that there are you know, probabilities wise that this T cell that is responding to insulin could have never gone to the pancreas and could have never seen this antigen. And so it could have spent its whole life circulating not energic, just not having run across this antigen presenting cell. Um, so it's hard to say exactly like the percentages that are energic or not because again some of the cells are just going to never find their antigen as a, a math problem. Um, but yes, you will have a fair number of T cells that are that have been energized here. Does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. Um, 
So as I mentioned before, um, and as you can see in this uh, image, um, technically there are two B7s, B7-1 and B7-2, known as CD80 and CD86. And if we're even more technical, there are tons of co-stimulatory molecules out there, tons. Um, what we understand about those co-stimulatory molecules is that um, they are sometimes found on different cells. So um, B7, for example, is really important on a naive T cell. Um, there are some other co-stimulatory molecules that might be important, say, on a memory T cell or on a B cell or something like that. Um, so uh, many of these co-stimulatory molecules fall into families. Um, but there are two others that I want to mention briefly. Um, so I'm not going to tell you about all the co-stimulatory molecules that exist. But there are two besides B7, CD80 or 86, that I do want to mention, or two proteins up here anyway. One thing that you can notice if we look at all of these different interactions is that some of those uh, proteins are like CD28 in that they lead to a positive signal on the cell. They activate the T cell. There are others that lead to negative signals. And they are really important in turning off the T cell. And so I want to tell you about two other uh, proteins that are shown on this slide. And in both cases, they lead to a negative signal to the T cell instead of leading to a positive signal to the T cell. B7-1 and B7-2 bind to CD28, as we have seen before. However, B7-1 or B7-2, CD80 or CD86, can also bind to another protein. And that protein is called CTLA-4. And so you can see here is a T cell on the left getting activated with um, the T cell receptor and CD28. So we're getting signal one and signal two um, for our T cell because our T cell makes CD28, our antigen presenting cell makes B7, and that B7 is binding to CD28. Sometimes our T cell also makes this protein called CTLA-4. And you can see CTLA-4 here. Um, so you'll notice it's still on the T cell. The T cell is also still making CD28. CTLA-4 also can bind B7. And if we look at the binding strengths here, CTLA-4 binds to B7 way better than does CD28. So if we're in a situation like the situation that we see on the right, where the T cell is making both CD28 and CTLA-4, so this B7 kind of has a choice, not that proteins have brains to think of things, but we'll say it has a choice. This protein has a choice of binding CTLA-4 or CD28. It's always going to bind CD28, or, or sorry, it's always going to bind CTLA-4 because it has that stronger connection. So in competition, CTLA-4 always wins. And when uh, the cell is getting a signal through signal 1 as well as CTLA-4, that says, stop being activated, turn off, we're done for that T cell.
And so the way that this actually really happens in cells is shown here. When our T cell is a naive T cell, our naive T cell is making CD28, which is this green thing. I don't know why it's not making the CD28 here. It should be. I don't know what they're doing. Whatever. So we're going to make CD28. This T cell you can think of as turn onable. <laughs> if the T cell sees an antigen presenting cell making signal one and signal two, it can be turned on. And perhaps it will be. Hooray. And now it's going to go do T cell things. Hooray. But when this T cell gets turned on, it also starts to make CTLA4. So at the beginning, it didn't make CTLA-4. At the end, it did. And so as soon as we turn the T cell on, we also provide an off switch. Once the T cell has been turned on, we now make it turn offable. So that if that T cell um, gets stimulated once, we turn it on. That T cell keeps getting stimulated over and over and over and over and over again, we turn it off. Because we don't want that T cell making cytokines and doing all of its functions forever and destroying like the whole lung. We want it to kill some SARS-CoV-2 infected cells and then we want it to shut off and stop. Um, and so if this cell was repeatedly coming in contact with T cell receptor plus B7, um, we would turn that cell off. Um, via CTLA-4. And so one thing that's really cool about T cell activation is when we turn on a T cell, we are automatically programming it to later be turned off because we don't want to leave that T cell on forever. Bad news bears would happen if we did. As you can see here, B7 CD28 and CTLA-4 are not the only types of co-stimulatory molecules. The one other co-stimulatory molecule um, that I like to mention is known as PD-1. You can see a naive T cell getting turned on with signal 1 and signal 2 here and then eventually getting turned off because of engagement of CTLA-4. When that T cell is at other times of its life, so maybe when that T cell is activated, it's not naive, it's not its first time seeing antigen, that T cell might use some other co-stimulatory molecules besides um, the ones that are seen here, um, both for being turned on and for being turned off. And one of those proteins that is used to turn the T cell off um, it, when that T cell was more of an activated cell, an antigen experienced cell, um, is PD-1, which is acting very similar to CTLA-4. And so you can see PD-1 here acting similarly to CD, uh, CTLA-4, turning off the T cells. And one thing that has been noticed about PD-1 as well is that as we actually look, oh, I, this is, today is a great day for this slide. If we actually look at certain T cells that get activated over and over and over again, they see antigen continuously nonstop for a really long time. They feel what happens to them is what happens to you guys in certain situations. So I'm going to give you an example of a couple of things. So what happens if I give you an assignment or a reading and you have to do it and then when you're done with it, it's over and you don't have to worry about it anymore. This would be like a T cell combating flu virus and when the T cell has combated flu virus, it's done and the flu virus is gone and we're all good. So that, that seems like an okay situation, right? Now what happens if I give you assignments 
and they never stop coming. I just keep giving you assignments and readings and assignments and readings and assignments and readings, and you can never get to the end because no matter what, as fast as you go, I just keep giving you more and more and more. Which is the case when there are certain microbes that persist and never go away. Chronic infections. What happens if I would give you chronic homework? How would you feel about that? Now remember, if I was a T cell, I went and I fought influenza virus, and then I, that influenza virus was gone, I would then go take a nap after I got rid of influenza virus. How, what's going to happen if I have this virus that never goes away, or if I have the chronic homework in your case? Yeah? Eventually, you get kind of burned out. You never have time to stop and take that nap. And in fact, what happens is a phenomenon officially known as T-cell exhaustion, where if we keep giving antigen over and over and over and over again, that T-cell gets burnt out and stops being able to do all of the things it should be able to do. We've noticed that when a T cell, that's happening to a T cell, that T cell starts to make a lot of PD-1. This is something that is important um, that I first learned about in thinking about chronic infections. However, if we have patients who have tumors, um, we'll see this again more later in the semester, and weirdly enough, more a little bit later today. Um, we actually do see some immune responses to those tumors. But if you think about it, that tumor never goes away. The tumor is there for a really long time, right, in our patient. One of the problems with immune responses in cancer is that the T cells get exhausted because they've seen that antigen every single day. <laughs> and the T cells are exhausted. You can also imagine in some other disease states, the T cells don't work because they're exhausted. This can actually be due to the negative signals that are coming from PD-1. So this can be due to that T cell getting too much PD-1 negative off signal. The T cell is exhausted, it's not doing it anymore. Or it can be due to the T cell getting too much negative signal through CTLA-4. This is the uh, information that is behind um, an important treatment idea that is used in a number of different um, situations known as checkpoint inhibition. This is uh, quite possibly one of the hottest cancer therapies there is. And now my brain is feeling mushy, but I'll say 2018 Nobel Prize, 2019 Nobel Prize, around then Nobel Prize <laughs> um, was given to the people who discovered CTLA-4 and PD-1 <laughs> and who discovered co-stimulation. Because what they realized is that if they provided a molecule that could block CTLA-4, you would never get that off signal in T cells. The T cells would only be able to get on signals. They'd stay on. They couldn't get exhausted. They couldn't get the negative turn off signal. And so those T cells would keep killing in the case of, in particular, cancers. Many um, really important cancer therapies now are specifically blockade of either CTLA-4 or PD-1, where we see drugs that are specific, that basically are antibodies. They don't signal, they just neutralize. They just block and get in the way. Like this neutralizing anti-CTLA-4 antibody, it just blocks and gets in the way of um, B7. So B7's only option is to interact with CD28 and give a plus signal, turn T cells on. We can never turn the T cells off. 
Um, so if you've heard about people who are on checkpoint inhibitor therapy, that's what this is. Um, if you see commercials about Keytruda or Optivo, that's what this is. Um, and this has honestly been um, an incredibly, incredibly, incredibly successful um, area of cancer treatment, all because we're just not letting those T cells get turned off. Um, so uh, this is uh, the things that we have just been talking about with Signal 1 and Signal 2, got a Nobel Prize, uh, or, or with Signal 2 got a Nobel Prize, because they have had so much promise um, in helping us understand checkpoint inhibition. Okay, so we've now seen the steps that our T cells need for activation. We need signal one and signal two. We're also going to see that T cell making IL-2 um, through the IL-2 receptor, and we're going to see that T cell starting to expand and differentiate to gain its function. And for the rest of the time today, we are going to focus on the bottom part of this, the red cells, and think about the differentiation and the functions of a CD8 T cell. On Wednesday, we'll do the CD4 T cell. And so our cell starts out as a naive CD8 positive T cell. That cell will be activated um, at a dendritic cell. It may also receive some cytokines from other neighboring cells. And that will allow that cell to differentiate, to gain new functions, as well as allowing that cell to proliferate and make many copies of itself. So we'll get a clone, an army of this. They're, they're, in fact, we make a clone of this called making a clone of the cells, so you can think of it as a clone army, um, of many more copies of this cell. We've said to the cell, you are useful, you are needed, we like you, make more copies of yourself. And now we're finally in a position where we have many copies of this cell and they are all active, where we can finally do something about the pathogen. You can see this here as well, where first we're going to have our CD8 T cell recognizing antigen at the case of the dendritic cell. That cell is going to proliferate. That cell is going to differentiate, which means mature or gain some new functions. One of those new functions is that the cell will leave the um, lymph node. and go out and find more copies of its antigen. So now we're going to go to some tissue. So one of the changes in the cell upon differentiation is changes in the trafficking molecules. So we can go somewhere other than the lymph node, like, oh, I don't know, the lung. And this cell is now going to have the ability to kill um, any cell that it finds that is um, presenting its antigen. This is really important. The cell is not going to be cytotoxic the first time it sees antigen. It has not yet gained that ability. That's good. It means that the dendritic cell doesn't get killed. It means that the dendritic cell can live another day and turn on another T cell. But when we go into the um, other organs, like, say, our SARS-CoV-2 infected lung, we can now kill those uh, infected cells. Um, in this situation, that second time our effector cell is seeing antigen and leading to uh, killing, it no longer needs signal 2. It just needs to see signal 1 now. Um, and that's good because we're probably not looking at dendritic cells anymore. Um, we're probably looking at other cell types that are, may not be so good at making signal two. So we don't need signal two. Basically, the shackles are off. This cell is ready to go. If it sees this antigen ever again after this initial activation, it's going to be able to kill. And you can see uh, this here. So our cytotoxic T cell is actually able to kill multiple 
uh, target cells. So it can interact with one target cell. It will specifically make this target cell die and leave all of the other cells alone. So if you had one infected cell in your lung um, and a whole bunch that were not infected, the not infected ones would be left alone and not messed with. Just the infected cell would die. That's, that uh, T cell is able to kill multiple cells as well. So it can in kill one cell, then it can leave and go kill another one, and leave and go kill another one. Um, and so that one activated CTL can kill many different types of cells. Um, sadly, the link here to a video of, seems to be down. I really like that video. But there are other videos. So this is another version of a uh, T cell killing video. I don't know how I can get it to full screen. But here is our T cell interacting with a cancer cell. Um, and you can see um, our little tiny purple T cell um, interacting with this very large cancer cell and um, sending a signal. You can see a pulse of signal coming in. And then you can see this target cell undergoing specific apoptosis. You can see that other cells that are not making direct contact with this T cell are perfectly fine. This guy doesn't die. It's just specifically this cell where that activated CD8 T cell is sending a signal to induce uh, cell death in that tumor cell. And so this is really what it looks like. You can see that this cell is fine. Um, it can kill another cell or the same cell over and over in a video. But if it wasn't just this video, it could like now go somewhere else and find another cell to kill. Um, so that's what this actually looks like. Um, the specific form of cell death that we are seeing here is apoptosis. Um, so earlier in the semester, we talked a bit about pyroptosis. Um, this is um, specifically apoptosis. So here is a healthy cell, and here we can see an apoptotic where we're going to have um, things like the nucleus fragmented. We're going to make these little bitty apoptotic bodies. This is that quiet cell death I talked about, where the cell is sort of di dying but not disturbing its neighbors at all. And we can think specifically about how our CD8 positive T cell is inducing apoptosis or is inducing its killing. Um, there are a couple of different ways that CTLs can kill their target cells. One of them is that our CTL can have a protein on its surface called fast ligand. Fast ligand can interact with another protein on the surface of other cells. And that protein is known, perhaps unsurprisingly, since it's binding fast ligand, as FAS. And so you can see the fast ligand on the CTL is interacting with FAS on the target cell. And so when the, you saw that little tiny T cell interacting with that big cancer cell, one thing that could have been happening is that FAS ligand on the surface of that T cell was interacting with FAS on the surface of that tumor cell. When this cell or any cell gets a signal through FAS, we see um, a signaling cascade get turned on. Normally, in order to have apoptosis happen, We have stuff go on to eventually go to the mitochondria. The mitochondria leaks its cytochrome C. That cytochrome C binds to things like APAF1, caspase 9, and we turn on caspase 3. And caspase 3 cuts stuff up to kill the cell. Um, and that is sort of the general apoptosis pathway that you heard in Bio 250. If a cell turns on fast, it turns on this other caspase, caspase 8. And caspase 8 just says, yeah, um, let's turn on the mitochondria stuff. We're just going to turn on all the mitochondria stuff. 
that could possibly be due for apoptosis. And also, we don't really want to wait that long, so let's also directly just turn on caspase 3. And so basically, we get caspase 3 on, and we activate the mitochondrial pathway, and we get all the apoptosis, <laughs> um, simply because of turning on caspase 8 um, after activating FAS. This is only one of the ways that CTLs are able to kill target cells. Um, and my guess from educated viewing of that little video that I showed you is that the second version is probably what was happening in that video, um, though I do not officially know that. Uh, so the other thing is that CTLs, when they are activated, so when a cell goes from being a naive T cell to a killer T cell, it starts to make these little packets inside the cell. They're basically special vesicles. They're known as cytotoxic granules or lytic granules. Basically, they're little bombs of toxic stuff that the cell has inside of it. If this, this CTL interacts with a target cell, that interaction will happen via MHC plus peptide interacting with T cell receptor and will have the immunological synapse that I told you about. Remember even with those adhesion molecules like integrins really holding the cell together very strongly? The cell can actually release, basically secrete or exocytose all of its granules its little toxic bombs in this area. The toxic stuff can't diffuse away because there's a wall made by the integrins. And basically, that cell is going to secrete toxic molecules at the target cell that it is trying to kill. And so our cell performs um, directional secretion and secretes these toxic molecules towards the target cell um, that eventually lead to the target cell's death. There are, a, and so you can see this here as well. Um, so our CTL can interact with a target cell. It will then sort of do some cool cell biology to get those little granules right by the target and release them onto the, at the target to kill the target. And then it can go away and do this again while the target undergoes apoptosis. There are two important things that we can think about that are in those granules. In reality, we think there's probably a lot of things in the granules. But there are two that are really famous <laughs> to most immunologists. One of them is a molecule called perforin. And so here you can see our cytotoxic granule. Here you can see one that has fused with the cell membrane to secrete its stuff. And one of the things that is inside is called perforin. When you hear the word perforin, what does it sound like or make you think of? What like in other word in the English language does perforin sound like? Yeah, Michael. Perforate. perforate. What's perforate mean? Specifically, it means makes holes in. So Natalie's notebook here has perforated paper. It has the paper has holes in it. Um, so perforin puts holes in the membrane of cells. Perforin basically pokes holes in that target cell we're trying to kill. So one of the things that we do is we secrete a protein at this target cell so that its membrane is compromised and its membrane is no longer intact. We've perforated that. We can now have stuff that should be inside the cell leak, stuff that should be outside the cell come in, problems in water balance, death, destruction. If you, uh, you can see some examples of perforin pores on the right of your slide. Um, so that's what a cell looks like after it has had perforin put on it. If you look at that image, um, does it remind you of anything else you have seen this semester? 
hints because I asked. The answer is probably yes. <laughs> yeah, cat. Exactly. When we talked about complement, I told you about the membrane attack complex that, as Kat correctly points out, mostly involves complement protein C9. Um, perforin and complement protein C9 are actually incredibly structurally similar. And a lot of immunologists and a lot of immunology textbooks are a little sketch because sometimes they show these pictures. And pictures of complement pores and pictures of perforin pores look exactly the same. And I kind of think sometimes they just pick whichever picture looks prettier and tell you it's whatever one. So the book says that this is perforin pores, but complement pores look so similar, this could actually be complement pores and they could be lying to us. Um, the other important thing that is in those cytotoxic granules is an enzyme. I can remember this is an enzyme because it has zyme in its name. And this enzyme is in a granule. It's in a cytotoxic granule. So it's a granule enzyme or granzyme. Um, there are a bunch of enzymes. This one um, ended up being really important, and it's called granzyme B. So you can see here is our cytotoxic granule. It is released on the surface of the cell. We've got a perforin pore, which already is pretty bad for the cell. But the perforin pore also lets all the other stuff into the cell. All the other toxic things can now get into the cell, including granzyme B. Granzyme B also does the same thing we saw happening in the FAST pathway. It says, yeah, we're just going to cut things. We're going to cut all the mitochondrial things to start mitochondrial apoptosis. And we're going to cut caspase 3 to start apoptosis that way too. And so granzyme B can basically just directly turn on all parts of the apoptosis pathway by cleaving many different types of substrates, including directly activating caspase 3. Um, and so here you can see um, all of these different molecules that are being made, as well as some other ones that we're not going to really focus on, by activated uh, CD8 T cells when they are CTLs. So you can see we have fast ligand killing cells through FAS. We also have perforin and granzymes. Uh, many uh, active CD8 T cells also make a lot of a cytokine called interferon gamma. That is not the same interferon we talked about earlier in the semester. Earlier in the semester, we talked about type 1 interferons, which are alpha and beta. Gamma is a type 2 interferon. Um, and gamma is often made to also help CD8 T cells do their function. People frequently measure interferon gamma as a way to measure CD8 T cells. And I'll say more about interferon gamma on Wednesday, because on Wednesday, we're going to talk about what happens to CD4 T cells. Um, so you guys will get an email from me um, with more details about Wednesday class. Um, I will see you then. And I also realized last time I told you I was going to hand something back, and then I so it was still in my folder when I got back to my office. So clearly I didn't hand it back. So I'll hand it back now. This is an old lab assignment that I just had in my folder and hadn't given you back to you. Um, so have a great next couple of days. Um, send me an email if you want to um, meet at any time to talk about any of this stuff. Hmm. Oh, it does have a name. I found the name. <laughs> um, your, um, your inquisitive grades from last week are already in Moodle. Your Moodle grades are all completely up to date. Um, and you will get some emails from me. Like I said, have a nice uh, next few days. <laughs>